the high level examiner's report for May 20... Oh, I put 2013. Bugger, that should be 2012. That's a little judgmental of them. That's from their report. Mother of God, that's basically the entire syllabus that people had trouble with. There's a tiny bit of repetition for the SL, but let's go. 100 centimetres is a metre, and if you cube both of those sides, that will give you the conversion factor for centimetres cubed to metres cubed. That's not too tricky. Next, writing redox half equations, stick the oxidation numbers underneath and try and work out what elements change the oxidation number. In this case, cadmium is going from 0 to plus 2, so just write that out. Keep the coefficients and stick in some electrons, otherwise it's not an equation. What else seems to change? Nitrogen from plus 5 to plus 2. Alrighty, so we could ignore the oxygen, that doesn't seem to have changed. And if you've done it right, then there should be the same number of electrons in each equation, but on different sides. Oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain. And you can just ignore the stuff that doesn't change oxidation numbers. Explaining trends in lattice enthalpies. So, that, so that's to do with crystals. Uh, that's a tiny person, and that's me. Now let's imagine we have two tubes of Pritt stick. If you were to cover the tiny person with Pritt stick and me with Pritt stick, well, let's do that. Da, da, da. Who is going to be stickier? The tiny person or me? Well, patently, the tiny person is going to be stickier. What the hell are you talking about, Thorny? Just, just give it a second here for the analogy. All right, let's get rid of her. Uh, let's make two identical me's. Put uh, one print stick on the first guy and three on the second guy. Here we go. Now, who's going to be stickier in this situation? Well, painly, the one with three tubes of print stick is going to be stickier. So, this is an analogy. You can see that the number of print sticks is proportional to the charge and the size is proportional to the size of the ions. So, small ions with a high charge are more attractive than big ions with a low charge. There must be a way of saying that that's easier. Yes, you're referring to something called charge density. The smaller it is the iron and the higher the charge, the more electrostatic attraction it will have. Let's draw out a little part of the periodic table. Those are going to be the alkali metals and the halogens. That's the weakest attraction there. Two big, fat, low-charged ions. The weakest attraction there. So the lowest lattice enthalpy. You don't need much energy to pull those guys apart. And lithium fluoride, well, those are tiny ions. And they're going to have the highest lattice enthalpy. It's going to take a lot of energy because there's a lot of electrostatic attraction. Their positive charge is concentrated in a tiny, angry little iron that's attractive. It moves on. Because if we compare plus one ions to plus two ions. All right, then. So you can see that potassium fluoride is going to be less attract, uh, have a lower lattice energy than calcium fluoride. So why would that be? Well, calcium and potassium ions are about the same size. Calcium is a little smaller, more protons in a nucleus. But the big effect is that calcium's got a 2 plus charge. So you can say the calcium ion has a higher charge density. It's a smaller ion than potassium, and it has a higher charge than potassium. The potassium ion. Next, Lewis structures, deducing the bond angles and shapes of the molecules. <laughs> Lewis, uh, if you email me there, I'll send you a little uh, augmented reality thing that might make it a little easier for you. Lewis, of course probably killed himself using hydrogen cyanide, which you can draw a Lewis structure for. So charge centers around the central atom, that's the key. What's a charge center? Single bond, double bond, triple bond, lone pair. Let's rip through these. Two charge centers around the central atom means it's going to be linear. So those are the three main examples there. Brillium chloride, carbon dioxide, hydrogen cyanide. Three charge centers, well, you're looking at something based on an equilateral triangle, trigonal planar. 
That's the carbonate iron. And uh, the nitrate iron. Nitrates uh, give you blue baby syndromes, but whenever I show the kids pictures of blue babies, they're always disappointed that the baby isn't blue enough for them, which is rather evil. Alrighty, three charge centres, but since there's only three atoms, that's going to be bent with a 120 angle. Moving on to the classics. Well, I'm deliberately drawing these out in 2D, so you might think, oh, everything's 90 degrees. No, it isn't. The tetrahedron isn't 90 degrees, it's 109 and a half degrees. Because it's in 3D, I'm representing these structures on a 2D screen when they're really 3D. And don't forget the dog's leg. Ooh, what an ugly dog. Now the lone pairs are forcing the other bonded pairs of electrons slightly closer together. And that results in a smaller bond angle. Moving on to the higher level shapes that you need to know. There are four of those. Let's kick off with the trigonal based bipyramidal. Why they don't just call it hexahedron, I don't know. There's the bond angles there. Oh, I knocked the wrong one off, silly silly man. I should have knocked off the equatorial one to make a seesaw. Not the axial one, silly boy. Uh, if there's six charge centres around the central atom, then you're going to be looking at octahedral, if there are six atoms bonded. But if there's a couple of lone pairs, as we'll see in the next example, and what the hell's 180 degrees? That's just silly, but they have insisted on that. And the square planar, that would have been knocking out the two axial pairs. Carbon-14, carbon dating, cobalt-60 is used to make x-rays, and iodine-125, 131 is used for medical imaging. Salt hydrolysis. Now, there's three sorts of questions they ask, but let me whip through this. Let's say calcium nitrate. That's made from an acid and a base, as as are all salts. Well, that's going to be calcium hydroxide, and what's going to, and that's a weak base. What's going to give me the nitrate? That's going to be nitric acid. That's a strong acid. So the pH goes with the strong one. All right. So the pH is going to be less than seven because it goes towards the strong one that made the salt. A little more detail, well they might ask you to explain that. So let's show the dissociation of the salt and then water underneath it. And calcium 2 plus and OH minus, oh that's actually calcium hydroxide is going to be formed in that solution there of, of, of the salt. So they're going to stick together, they're weak. And that's going to have the hydroxide ion removed, leaving the H plus behind because the H plus is going to remain dissociated. It's not going to want to stick on nitrate. That would make a weak acid, a strong acid. Mm, pi. Pi is, uh, well, that's to do with the delocalization of electrons. It's the pi electrons, not the sigma ones. I taught this one for years. It's the movement of pi electrons between at least three atoms. I always used to miss that last bit out. It has to be at least three atoms. Carbonate iron, again, is a classic example. There are three resonant structures, the same one, rotated by 120 degrees, and there's a couple of curly arrows. Physical properties in terms of structure and bonding, my God, that's like 10% of the whole course. That's chapter 14. I can't be doing anything too big on that. These are the bonds, the bondings you need to know. I put them in order of how much energy it takes to break those bonds. Buffer. Well, that's a weak acid and a sort of weak acid. Weak base, sort of a weak base. Resist the change in pH on the addition of acid and base. No! The addition of a small amount of acid or base. You don't say small amount, you've got it wrong. Let's choose hydrofluoric acid as our weak acid. That dissociates into H plus ions and fluoride ions. Now, if I was to throw more acid in there, there'd be a problem. The equilibrium would shift to the left, removing the stress of the added acid. But you know what? There's not enough fluoride ions to take all those H pluses away and turn them into HF. So it won't buffer acid. I need more fluoride ions. You can't just put fluoride ions in. 
You have to put sodium fluoride in, for example. That will completely dissociate, producing lots of fluoride. And you fix your problem. Now you won't run out of fluoride. Whew, we're halfway there.